In Eastern philosophy, there's this concept called neti neti. It's not this, not that. And it's kind of trying to get you towards the meaning of life. So you would say like, once I make my first, you know, six figure a year, like then I'll be happy. The first time it happens, you feel good for like maybe a year or something, right? You're like really proud of yourself. You buy yourself some nice stuff. You, you know, take your girlfriend out, wherever. That game continues. The stakes get higher, right? It's New York City apartments, it's cars, it's vacations, it's honeymoons, it's weddings. It's very similar to the behavior of addiction. Like you just, like you need a little bit more. One year I had this, like I made seven figures in one year. Like that's, that's a crazy thought still to this day. It felt good. Like I, I put money in my kids' college funds and like bought myself like some, you know, $300 sneakers. But we're back to that concept of neti neti. It's like, not this, not that. That wasn't it. Like, what is it? What is that feeling that like makes you come alive every moment? Is it crazy to think that that can't be a part of my life? I had achieved a lot of the things that I wanted to achieve, but I didn't feel any closer to that feeling of what is it, what makes me come alive. I was like, you know what? This is not the playbook. I'm actually playing the wrong game. My name is Kei He. I'm a writer, an entrepreneur, and a teacher, and I'm a creator. So this by far is the most important part of the office. Now, a little secret is that these surfboards don't actually live here. This is purely decorative. And this, as you can tell, is my go-to board. So I'm constantly shuttling it back and forth from the garage where it should be to my office because it makes for a wonderful, wonderful backdrop. Behind this surfboard, You'll see a tribute to where we used to live in Dumbo, Brooklyn. But this is my favorite picture. Before I turn it around, my daughter was in pre-K and she was asked to dress like her dad for school. So, you ready for this? She's got the flat brim undefeated hat, uh, a skateboard, a jean jacket, <laughs> and her pajamas. So that is what my daughter thinks my work outfit looks like. The one time she did see me wear a tie, she goes, how come you're dressed like President Obama? <laughs> I think to really understand young K, you have to understand my parents. My dad was born in Cambodia. My mom is half Cambodian, half French. My parents came to the United States, to New York City with barely any money no friends, no family, barely speaking the language. I had inherited a lot of the things that they were trying to go through, which was how do I fit in? How do I start a life here? How do I build a life here? How do I feel safe? You know, there was always food on the table, but it was to some extent a question of survival. Like, do we belong here? I'm an American citizen. I spoke French. I was in ESL. I was not a cool kid. I was skinny and I walked with a gait and I was like smart and I did other kids homework for them and we packed our lunch. So there were always all these things that other people had that I wanted. I basically said to myself, no one's ever going to tell me what I can or can't have. Initially, that was through the lens of money. And then as I started to approach college age, it was like become an engineer or work on Wall Street. I rerouted all my energy toward those goals. It's like if you are a 22-year-old with this job or a 28-year-old that has this apartment, you will be accepted, you will be respected, you will be loved, you will find love. I mean, that was a big one, finding love. It sounds so backwards now, but you're like, if I have like a lot of money, then I'm lovable. You know, you would think that hearing me talk, it was like world domination was my plan. But really it was just like, I just want a wife who loves me and like, I want to have, you know, a couple kids. I probably wouldn't have said that out loud in my 20s, but I know for damn sure now that that was like the motivating factor. 
I went to Yale undergrad, the Wall Street banks descend on campus. They like show you the numbers. They say, if you work here for three years, you'll make this much money. You're like, in three years, I'll make more money than my dad ever made in his entire life. So you go into Wall Street, eyes wide open. Everyone tells you 80 hour work weeks, 100 hours, you'll sleep at your desk, you'll pull all nighters. So to some extent, you kind of know what you're getting into. I think that a few things that quickly caught me off guard. One is there's a lot of a-holes in the industry. And I'm a sensitive person. I care about others. I try to be empathetic. And not only is that not appreciated, it's kind of viewed as a distraction. The second thing that was the biggest surprise is less about the number of hours worked, but you have zero control over your day. You're holding your phone and at any point in the day at night or night, someone can call you and say, come to the office right now. The thing that really set it off for me was that I really wanted to do a weekly community service project. And it was at Saturday, like somewhere between 9 a.m. and noon. I got called out off of it like 80% of the time. I couldn't even be in that volunteer project. That's when it hit me, it's like, maybe this world is just not for me. There was also a lot of drinking and like a lot of parties. So it was kind of this like, I think in hindsight, the whole thing is like a giant numbing cycle. Like you numb yourself from, you know, some of the things you're insecure about through work. And then you get off of work and then you numb yourself with partying and drinking because you're like, I can't believe I just worked 100 hours. What's the point of this? So you're in this like weird numbing cycle. One of my spiritual teachers has this phrase, he's like the pebble in your shoe, where it's there's something in your foot that's bothering you, but it's not bothering you enough and you can still keep walking. And I was like, something feels off. So now I'm in my early 30s. I have one kid. I've done this for a while. You know, I own my own apartment. Like, I'm married. And I have a certain title. By the old playbook, that's it. I've arrived. Like, I'm here. We did it. You know, like, high-fiving myself and all of that. But, like, still. The pebble was there. Most people just keep walking with the pebble because it's just not annoying enough to like take your shoe off, look at the contents, take out the pebble, put your shoe back on, tie your knots, keep walking again. I knew that there was something else. Like what is that feeling where you jump out of bed so excited to be alive? What is that activity where you just lose yourself in time. The newsletter started in January of 2015. I was on vacation in Turks and Caicos and I was a little bit checked out and I was just reading some stuff on the internet. I've always loved the internet and Twitter and all that and I just found some interesting articles and I just created in a 36 person email BCC on Gmail. I was, I, the title, I remember this so vividly, five interesting links from my recent vacation. And I was like, oh, this is like a cool little cornucopia of links. And by the way, 2015 is way before everyone had a link blog email newsletter. And I just sent it as a BCC and the famous last sentence was, I'm not sure when I'll have time to do this again, because I was on vacation. I actually don't think I did it for one or two more weeks. And people started to reply and they're like, this is, that was really good. Like, where'd you find these things? And, and in my mind, I was like, I just found them on Twitter, right? <laughs> it, like Wall Street people back then were definitely not on Twitter. And so I was like, okay, they thought it was cool. I like reading lots of internet articles. Blurbing them was like a little cool little value add. I strongly believe that if there's something that I know or have access to, that would benefit someone else, then it's my duty to, to share it with them. And so I think what made the newsletter such a powerful thing was, it was really just riding off of the coattails of that sense of duty that was just in my bones. 
I grew up skateboarding and I love board sports. I love surfing, I love snowboarding. So I always had that kind of West Coast vibe to me. And so um, I always loved the word rad because it's short, it's one syllable. There's different definitions of it, but the one that I attach to is to be effortlessly cool. That made me feel so excited. And I said like, there's gotta be a way that you can translate that energy and enthusiasm into a way that allows you to make a living. I owe it to myself to try to figure that out. Maybe it's not possible. Maybe all these people are right, that like, you gotta go through the motions. You gotta get on the hamster wheel. You gotta get a mortgage. You gotta send your kids to this school. Then when you have your third kid, you gotta get a minivan. And you'll stop traveling for the first 10 years of your kids' lives. Like, Maybe that is true, but damn, I wanna just try the alternate hypothesis that that's wrong, or at least it's wrong for me. I guess you could say I quit because I didn't feel alive. Like people thought I had lost my mind. I think that they wanted to get me committed I found out later that a group of friends had a text thread of staging an intervention. The intervention was, let's get him to stop writing on the internet just in case he wants to come back to the industry. They'll never hire this weepy, emo, former Wall Street bro, and let's just save him from himself. It's interesting what happens when you leave the establishment. I had you know, through mostly luck, a little bit of hard work and, and a little bit of good timing, got in the highest title in the company. You have people that are nine years older than me that didn't have the title that I had, that were working towards it, and I walk away from that. So right away, it's just, it's messy because you're basically saying to people, I have what you want and I don't want it. Someone who knew me well told a friend, I've seen this playbook before. They don't realize how much money they spend. They think it's easy to be an entrepreneur. They're actually not cut out to be entrepreneurs. They're gonna spend way more money than they think and mark my words in five years, his wife will leave him. And I'm like, are you serious? This is someone who knew me well, saying this behind my back and it got back to me. That was hard. I wasn't sure that I was making the right decision. Plus, on top of that, at least if you're gonna quit, have a plan. I didn't have a plan. My wife, Lisa, is incredible, and we're always on the same page on these big life decisions. We don't start on the same page, but they're not happening without us both being on the same page. She's like, I trust you. So the first thing I did is I just stopped carrying my phone around with me. And that was just totally liberating. So I'd worked for 15 years, basically. And when you're not working, you're always kind of working. So there's always that expectation, that reflex to grab your phone, like, ah, oh. like you see an email that you didn't want to see and you don't have to do it that, you know, I was old enough that like, I didn't have to do it at that moment. But then it kind of like sticks in you, like in the back of your head and you're hanging out with your kid, but you're writing that response. I never knew what it was like to not have that feeling as an adult. But I remember we were in New York, Soraya, my eldest was 14 months and we just walked around on Tuesdays. I started blogging and I was blogging in a very vulnerable way. And all my Wall Street friends were like, you're a Wall Street guy, we, we're not vulnerable. And even if we are, we don't say it and we're men and we're strong and we're this and we're that. And I was like, I'm really scared. I don't know if this is the right decision. It's such a cliche. I say it's the family version of Eat, Pray, Love, right? And I guess I'm Julia Roberts. I think the thing about Bali that was really powerful was that I left my social circle 
And if I was just in New York City going through my social life, seeing the people that were asking me what I was doing next and why I didn't have a plan and what I was gonna do for money and don't you think this is crazy and what are your kids gonna think? So I needed a place where I could just stumble around without judgment. I view the newsletter in that period right after I quit as an identity anchor because it's really hard to leave something established and not have an identity anchor. And so I could kind of point to that and say like, oh, this is kind of the thing, right? And it was never meant to be a business. Uh, it was just like a fun thing that I did. The newsletter really became like a launch pad for creative expression. That in some ways was the biggest event and the biggest non-event. So it was the biggest event because to my mom and dad, they're like, he made it. <laughs> and I mean, I think 6,000 subscribers in three days. It was one of those things where I was hitting refresh and the subscriber count just kept going up every time I hit refresh. So in that regard, you're like, oh my God, I'm like, book publishers were reaching out to me overnight, literally overnight. It was the biggest non-event because as any creator knows, just because you get 6,000 new subs, if you don't have a business model, if you don't have a monetization plan, if you don't have a big idea, book publisher don't care, bank account don't care. <laughs> no one cares <laughs> except your mom and dad. I do think it was a watershed moment for Rad Reads because of that explosive growth. And it just, it got me in pockets of viewership that I just didn't have access to on my own. But it was a non-event because a year after that, I still had no idea what I was doing. What I truly believe is the secret to my entrepreneurship is that I created a way for myself to stick around long enough to give it the best chance of working. And your mind might immediately go towards like money or financial security, but no, it's like inner critic, self-doubt, imposter syndrome, chasing things that you don't really want self-judgment, judging others, competition, source of motivation. These are all things that might seem super difficult to one person or like so down the fairway to another, but I have invested so much time and so much money in making sure that my head is screwed on right. I've just been able to stay emotionally solvent long enough to have planted enough seeds and watered them, and now there's like a forest growing. But if I had to tap out after year two, I would have maybe planted one seed that didn't even have enough time to grow. But year six, there's like 10 seeds that are like saplings. And year 10, there'll be like 50 seeds that are trees. And so it's really just buying yourself the time to let your gifts, your lights like shine through. And it takes a lot of time like I just did the math, I probably spend 10,000 hours writing email in the past six years. If you show up for six years and get out of your way as often as possible, you're probably going to be just fine. So this is like my home setup and you could see the jankiness of it with like the $10 stand and the books to support it. It's all about live teaching now. I've always been a productivity nerd. For me, productivity has always been in service of. And so it's in service of more time with loved ones. It's in service of more time on the beach. It's in service of your business running when you're chilling. I launched the course in September 2019. So that was about four years after I started the newsletter. 
Now, the thing about the newsletter that I now fully, fully appreciate is that the audience, the trust that I've built with them can be a catalyst for all different types of business ideas. Online courses, coaching, merch, eBooks. If I were to ever get a book deal, like it would be the catalyst. Now, it doesn't come for free. Like you got to show up every week. I'll, this week will be my 306th week writing the newsletter. So you got to show up. It's, it's, not a, it's not a gimme. But once you have it and if it's fun, you have that relationship, it's, it is magical because not only that, they're, they're your customers, they're your friends, they're your feedback loops on new ideas. They're your lens into the world. They're your empathy building muscle. And so it's just this like really, really powerful self-sustaining flywheel. Hello everyone. Hello, Michael. Hello, John. Lexi, good to see you. Sarah, surfing recently? We got some good Southern California swell. Ah, good to see everyone. When you're stuck, when you hit resistance, examine the craving. What if this were easy? What's behind this? What is the emotion behind the blocker? What is the desire behind the underlying desire? You've all seen this, but I want to just uh, bring it back up. The regrets of the dying. I wish I hadn't worked so hard. I wish I had the courage to express my feelings. I wish I'd stayed in touch with my friends. I wish I'd let myself be happier. I wish I'd have the courage to live a life true to myself, not to the life others expected of me. Living in Manhattan Beach was kind of a cool change. It was my first time living in a house. A lifelong dream had come true, and that was to be able to walk to the beach. I felt like I won the lottery. If you're stuck and you're like wondering what if, or how could I, or is it possible? The first thing I always tell people is, is it a push or is it a pull? If you feel like it's a push, like I need to leave this thing or run away from this bad boss or bad lifestyle or bad industry, I would be careful because the thing you're running from, you may discover that is not actually the thing you thought you were running from and it might be way more internally driven. However, the pull is when you're all consumed by some idea, some little project, some philanthropic cause, activism, whatever that thing that like makes you come alive, that's the pull. Where time dissolves as you're thinking about it, as you're working on it. And the beauty about having a full-time job is if you start to feel that pull, you don't have to quit yet. Experiment with it, play with it, do it like five minutes a day, 10 minutes a day. I realized that with all that tinkering and all those side projects, 5% of my free time was bringing 100% of my life satisfaction. Then once you hit that tipping point, then might be the moment to like take the plunge.